Hi everyone, Adrian Grunewald again of Global Leadership Platform and this is our hash Global Leadership Conversation number two. As I say, last year we went to every continent and spoke to influencers and experts on leadership about the state of leadership in the world and now it's time to do the second round. But this time it's under a vision that we um, coin 2020 DAL. So hash 2020 DAL, Decade of Authentic Leadership. And in essence it is somehow a revolution over the next decade to to expedite the emergence of authentic leaders uh, in order to turn the tide on weak toxic and incompetent leadership everything rises and falls on good or bad leadership and we know that so we can't keep doing the same things over and over i'm now speaking to interviewing having short discussions with experts and influencers authors all over the world again on every continent i hope about authentic leadership we seem to feel that we need that sort of leader. And with me today is Chris Pierce. He's a Forbes leadership contributor. He has been working with CEOs and directors and senior managers for many years. He's also the author of A Broken CEO. Now, I don't know exactly what that title means. In some way, maybe it'll come into the conversation, but I do think our world is so complex that we may find more broken CEOs out there than we realize. But I think the book has a more positive spin to it. It's not just about what a broken CEO is. Um, but Chris, welcome all the way from London at the moment, eh? Indeed, yes. Thank you very much, Adrian. So, Chris, let's get onto the same page. Please describe to us um, what your understanding is or your beliefs around an authentic leader or authentic leadership. Yeah, well, delighted to do that because I think you're getting to the, the crux of the, the whole matter of leadership with that one word, authentic. Uh, it's it's become a bit of a platitude, but fundamentally it means self-referencing. And it's of course related to the word automatic, which means um, able, able to operate by itself. Um, so for me, or, uh, an authentic leader is one that has sufficiently developed in a compass to be able to refer to themselves and use them, their, their inner self as a frame of reference, rather than being swayed, influenced, pushed and pulled by all the external stuff that's going on, whether that's circumstances or more likely people who are, who are, are, are trying to, uh, in, in, in many cases, um, get the result that they want out of the leader. But an authentic leader is self-referencing and one that looks to their own inner self for direction. Okay. I mean, obviously, I've heard a lot of angles, but that's a very interesting one. Would you say that that is the kind of leader we need now more than ever before in the history of the world? We've got all these wonderful uh, descriptions of the kind of world, the VUCA world, and all those sort of things that we live in. Do we need more self-referencing leaders than before? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, I think we need, um, but it starts with, it starts with self-awareness. Um, for me, leadership starts with the self. Uh, we, you know, it, it's generally um, thought to be about telling other people what to do or, or inspiring other people. But from my point of view, you can't really make a hash of leading others until you've sorted your own self-leadership out. Um, first and foremost, we've got ourselves to lead. We've got a life to lead. Um, e even if we're, we're just parents at home, we might have to take the lead with the family. Um, if you can't get that right, then you're going to struggle leading a team or an organization where the, the, the dynamics are, are much more demanding. So for me, it's about self-awareness, looking to one's inner self, understanding one's inner dynamics, particularly the, the, the thinking and emotional worlds, because it's, it's very much the feeling world that determines how we act. And, and just to um, illustrate that, uh, it, it's, it's generally thought by a, a lot of leaders, particularly male leaders for some reason, um, that their leadership is, is very logical, very rational, and that they, they make decisions based on, on reason, analysis, etc. cetera. Um, in fact, that couldn't be further from the truth. All decisions are made on the basis of how we feel. And there was some very interesting work done by a chap called Antonio Damasio, which uh, uh, underlines that he, was a, uh, he is a, a neuroscientist and uh, proves pretty conclusively through a lot of meta-studies that it is our feeling center 
that allows us to make decisions. Um, so I think it's incumbent on leaders to understand their own inner thinking and particularly feeling worlds, their own inner dynamics, in order to be able to self-lead before they can really stand a chance of leading bigger entities. Okay, Chris, now we live in a world where it's so dynamic, hyperdynamic. I mean, everything impacts everything, and it's so external, and it's so visible, and measured by external results and, and, and visibility, and I can go on and on. So how big is the gap between what you're saying we need, that sort of leader, and what's practically... Oh, it's huge. Out there? It's, it's absolutely huge. And, and um, part of the problem, I mean... <laughs> You know, not every organization is dysfunctional or broken. Not every leader is broken by any means. Um, but if you look at the spectrum, at one end, you'll find the authentic leaders who do what, what needs to be done, regardless of, of all the, the, the external pressures that are, uh, are going on. They, and they succeed um, to a greater or lesser extent. But then you look at the other end of the spectrum where the pressure for results, particularly fast financial results is overwhelming so if you look at um, listed companies for instance mm -hmm. where the stock price is everything and decisions are made on the basis of what it's going to do to the stock price almost from well certainly day to day sometimes with an even smaller uh, time scale than that then those pressures are enormous and they they will they can only de destabilize um, the, uh, the, the, the compass of the leader if the leader, he or she, allows that to become the, the guiding light, if you like. Mm. All right. Um, not, not easy, but we, we know this must be done. Um, just empower the leaders a little bit more with a principle, a theory, a, a tip or a gem that, that they can implement in their lives to be authentic leaders, better authentic leaders. I mean, you've worked with coached leaders for many years on all levels, particularly senior levels, written. Mm. Um, give us an essence that leaders can implement in their lives. Well, I, I mean, a very practical thing, um, and I'll give you a bit of background before, before I, I mention this. Um, one of the... Uh, the balances that a lot of leaders don't get right is what's commonly called work-life balance. In fact, work-life is a completely false dichotomy. It doesn't make any sense at all because work is life. You know, there, there is no, no split between the two unless you're going to be dead at work and, and no one would want that. Although I admit that perhaps we might feel a little bit, <laughs> a little bit lifeless at work at times. Um, but the real dichotomy, the important one, is work-rest. That's, that's the key one that, that needs to be held in balance. And it's, it's a similar balance to, um, for instance, the balance between black type on a white page. If you have too much type on a white page, you can get far more information onto that page. But you reduce the accessibility of the information you make it more difficult to understand mm. and it actually becomes quite tiring to read so the balance between work and rest is similar in order to derive meaning and um and achievement from work you need to have a degree of rest proper rest and i think I, the one thing I, I would say to leaders is that they pay respect to the natural balance between work and rest, not work and life, because that's a false dichotomy, as I said, but work and rest for themselves and their people. Um, and I could, I could go on about this because there are very different forms of rest. Um, and th I think the one thing missing in society generally is true mental rest. You know, even when we go home, kick mm. our shoes off, sit down, cuddle the dog, get a gin and tonic, stick our feet up and watch TV. That's not really rest. That's zoning out. Physically, it's rest, but mentally, you're still, you're still on. So I think it's, it's very important. In fact, I, I teach all my um, CEO and director clients 
uh, to establish a, a, um, a practice of meditation. Uh, it's a secular practice, you know, it's, it's nothing, there's nothing religious about it. Um, but this has a real impact on the way that they can rest their minds after a day of, of, of you know, intense activity. Mm. So, all right. So, so family and exercise and studying uh, outside of the 10-hour working day or, or more? It's all good. All good. Mm. But it's, um, it's not rest. You know, the, 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 the real, really deep-rooted rest is, is conscious rest. Um, sleep isn't conscious rest because, obviously, you're unconscious. So uh, meditation and similar practices give you the opportunity to rest the body and the mind for a short period of time in a way that nothing else does. So, so I don't know, maybe this is a simplistic way of looking at it, but... When I'm engaging my family, I'm working on my family. When I'm exercising, let's say I'm working on me. When I'm at yep. work, I'm working on the business and I'm working on, on a contract. But you're saying there comes a time when you must switch off all kinds of work, if, if I could use the word so liberally, and, and literally just rest, meditate, um, find yes. a way to be absolutely still. Yes. Otherwise, I don't rejuvenate, re-energize my entire state. Is, is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. And the, the practice of meditation has many other benefits as well. Um, it's, it, it, it boosts um, resilience and it allows you to, uh, to weather all kinds of emotional storms that you would find it very difficult to otherwise. And I, this, it's not just me saying this from my practice. I've, I've seen this and I've heard my clients report this as a result of a very simple regular practice they're just not so prone to getting caught up in the emotions of things mm. they're less likely to get involved in conflict they feel stress less than they did before so it, it's it's a very it's a very powerful tool and it's one that i would absolutely uh, recommend to anyone that is living a, a very active life by all means do all the other stuff you know i'm not saying that this other stuff isn't good it is good um but a, a meditative meditative exercise is the only one that affords conscious mental rest from otherwise you know 12 16 hours of of mental um activity non-stop so uh, not to extend the conversation too long but i'm interested more in not just waking up early and spending 20 minutes half hour let's say meditating or even late at night whenever but what you do during the day the ability to find moments yeah. you still almost meditate for for one minute 10 seconds yes. before meeting or absolutely that discipline yep. must one must get there surely otherwise the morning can help of course still your mind and and you focus on whatever um, but during the day, life just happens. It does, and it's a very good practice to interrupt uh, the flow of activity, to take control of it, um, and to just, for instance, at the end of a meeting, stop and just to be silent for however long you've got. 30 seconds is fine. Mm. And, and make a point of interrupting the flow of activity. Otherwise, it's it pulls you along with it. And before you, before you know it, you're eating your lunch and writing emails at the same time. Mm. Yeah. And, and watching the news. You know, it's, it, it's too much. We need some downtime. We need some white space on the page. Um, so absolutely, I'd say, you know, in, 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 interrupt that flow during the day. Yeah, that makes 100% to me, 100% sense. So very quickly, tell us what else we must do on a global scale, on a larger scale, to somehow expedite the emergence of authentic leaders and close this gap um, of leadership deficit that we have all over the world. Well, I, I think the problem with many leaders is that they are very good with the, the mechanics of leadership, the mechanics of running an organization. So that could be management strategy, marketing, um, HR, all of that stuff. 
you know, or very necessary, but it's not sufficient. And w there is an absolute dearth of an understanding of the dynamics of leadership. In other words, the way that one's own inner dynamics, one's behavior, one's relationships with the senior team play out into the organization. I'll give you one example of that. The culture of an organization is, from, from what I've seen, wholly determined by the behavior of the senior team. It's nothing to do with the values. Values are a waste of time. They're not worth the wall they're, they're posted on. But the actual behavior of the senior team is fundamental to the culture of the organization. So if you want to change the culture of the organization, you look to the senior team, including, absolutely including the CEO, and you look at their behavior, and you look to modify that to change the culture. Now, a lot of leaders don't understand that. They don't realize that connection, that fundamental connection between their, their inner thinking, feeling, how that plays out into their behavior and how that affects the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, they need to. They need to understand their inner dynamics. They need to be more self-aware. They need to understand the concept of self-leadership, authentic leadership, if you like, different word for the same thing. And I think it's, it's a, <laughs> I, I would hate to get to a point where we are regulating uh, leadership in order to make sure that it's good enough. Um, I, I'm not sure I'd be a fan of that, but we have to find some way of being able to educate, train, coach people in these very elevated positions with a huge amount of responsibility and power and influence. We have to be able to educate them to see the connection between their inner worlds and how that plays out into the organization. Mm. Self-awareness, basically. Self-awareness, yeah. We need more of that. Chris, just finally, uh, what are you doing or your business doing to close that gap? And well, um, I, uh, my, my business, I, I personally, I run leadership development programs. So I take leaders, CEOs, directors, or senior managers of large organizations, um, and I put them through a six-month uh, development program which is a combination of material that I've written. And it splits into three, three main directions. It's the personal direction, so personal development, looking inwards. It's the relational development, so looking at how that plays out into relationships with the people around you. And then the leadership element, how you implement that knowledge, that insight into the way that you lead the organization. And that is supported with one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions with me. Um, and then over and above that, I've just written a book, which you mentioned, uh, called The Broken CEO. Uh, it's a rather dark title, but it's uh, offset slightly by the subtitle, which is How to Be the Leader You Always Wanted to Be. And that explains um, much of what we've been talking about. Uh, and really, I think offers a, a different view to the one normally associated with leadership, which is all about leading other people, you know, getting other people to do your bidding, to do what you want to do, um, which actually is a very short-sighted approach, um, one that you've clearly identified through your initiative. So um, that's, to answer your question, that's what I'm doing to address the problem that you and I see very clearly. Yeah. Chris Pierce, thank you so much. All the best with what you're doing. Uh, we need more Chris thank Pierce you. in the world. And uh, thank <laughs> you for your time that you've given us in, in having a brief conversation around this, this challenge. And just a reminder for everyone, this is our Hash Global Leadership Conversation 2 as part of our 2020 Decade of Authentic Leadership. It's a revolution to change things, to shake things up. And you'll see it under Hash 2020 DAL. Chris Pierce, thank you for your time. Thank you, Arthur.